I'm Michael Simmons, the DP from Halloween Kills, and this is The Go Creative Show. Hello and welcome to The Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. My name is Ben Consoli, and today we speak with Michael Simmons, the director of photography for Halloween Kills. Michael, welcome back to The Go Creative Show. Thank you for having me back. Last time we had you on was for Halloween the uh, in 2018. China, was it? Did it have a subtitle that uh, that year, or was it just Halloween? I know it was sort of the reboot of the franchise. I think it's just referred to as Halloween, but it, with within the industry and fans, it's Halloween 2018. Halloween, exactly. Halloween 2018 <clears throat> and uh, Halloween Kills. I just finished it yesterday. I loved it, and I cannot wait to talk to you about it. Before we get there, real quick, I want to mention our sponsor today, MZ Empowering Filmmakers. And of course, I encourage you guys to follow us on your favorite podcast app, as well as twi Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. All things Go Creative Show at gocreativeshow.com. So, Michael, we, like we said earlier at the top, you were, you were on for Halloween 2018, as we all love to call it. Um, and now you're back for this one. Did you shoot both of these at the same time? Was it, was it that kind of a production? Yeah, you know, we thought about that, and there were some rumors of that, but uh, I think we ended up not being able to pull it off or something like that. So we did not shoot them back to back, although we did complete Halloween Kills a very long time ago. I can't yeah. remember the date, but uh, it had to be shelved for a year due to COVID. Yeah, and it's like all of those movies that are kind of been shelved due to COVID are coming out now, and I can you can just tell when I talk to these directors of photography, it's like this this like sense of relief just to be like, finally, it's out there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Especially the ones that people were highly anticipated, like Halloween. We had the, um, we're going to be talking mm -hmm. to the Many Saints of Newark and um, 007, like all these movies that people have been just waiting and waiting to see finally getting out there. It has to feel good. Yeah, well, you, you have a disassociation with the project, you know, and they've done so much that stuff since. So it's a, it's a bittersweet pill. Do you, do you start, like once a film is done for you, does it kind of just leave your mind and it's on to the next one? I like shooting movies and that's, and I like watching movies. Any other aspect of movie making, I have no interest in or, or quite little. So, I mean, so, I mean, scripts, zero interest, editing, zero. I like waking up, going to a set, seeing the trucks, having a blank slate, achieving a, a goal or creating a new goal going home, having the movie in my mind that I made, and then wrapping it. And then I mean, out of curiosity, I see in the theater and see what they've made of it. Do you, do you <clears throat> include kind of the, that color process? I know you said you're not that very interested in post. What about color? Color is, is a super important, necessary evil that's beyond tedious and boring and takes <laughs> forever. But um, I, I, I love that. I, I go through it, but it's not the part of the problem. I'm not a perfectionist whatsoever. I like creating scenes, I like creating stories and drama and conflict. I don't so, care. I mean, how dark the black is, is it's sort of a, you know, it's a trend, it's something you have to you follow a little bit. That is like, that's fascinating to me and kind of refreshing, to be honest with you, having <clears throat> just an approach that is, it's not about the, the minutia. It's not about making everything perfect. Um, Talk to me a little bit more about that. Like, has that always been your philosophy or is this something that has grown over time? I'm just a cinephile. You know, I grew up uh, going to, you know, anthology archives every day in New York City. And, what, you know, my favorite screenings of movies had giant scratches straight through the middle, you know, at revival houses. And it doesn't, it never bothered me or, or, a, or a vinegaring of like a Fellini print. So, and, and seeing, you know, movies in 16 millimeter theaters. So I, I like the shot reverse shot. I like the scene. I like the mise en scene. I like how, how uh, shots progress. And that's what I'm interested in. And then I like how to achieve those things within a certain amount of time given. And that math formula, the real, um, I'm not obsessive compulsive when it comes to uh, the, the, the final print. For, I use, and I've done a lot of color printing and I was never particularly good at it because you know, how many hours can you spend trying to get the contrast right in the things? Some people could spend infinite amount of hours. And then there's other people that are like, I think it's pretty close to done. <laughs> I don't think it's going to get any better than it is. Yeah. 
you just kind of leave it into the hands of your host team, I guess. I mean, just sort of. Well, no, no, I'm, I'm very involved. I'm involved. I mean, I'm there for however many weeks we spend color correcting every minute of it, but it's not something that I find um, that enjoyable. Yeah. I can see that for sure. I mean, there is something, I think there's a different type of person that enjoys editing and the post-production process, especially things like visual effects, which to me, that that is my threshold. Like, I like editing, but when it comes to visual effects and you're looking frame by frame by frame on something, it's like, oh my God, I'm yeah. amazed by it, but I just, that process, I can't take it. It drives me insane. Yeah, it's just not why you got, I got in the business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so why, I guess, let, let's continue down this road. Why did you get into the business? Was it just a love of films and filmmaking? I mean, there's a big, there's a ton of people out there in the world that just love watching films. They're just big, you know, they just like movies. But then a small fraction of that group goes to actually make them. So what was it for you that inspired you to get into this industry and actually make these movies? Well, like filmmaking is the antithesis of movie watching. Okay, so for instance, movie watching, you transcend time, you, you, you don't know, fully understand how long you've been sitting somewhere. You don't even really understand what's going on from shot to shot. You're just enjoying this thing and you get wrapped up in it. Movie making is the complete opposite. It's the deconstruction of that process. It's, uh, um, and I always say that for people that truly love watching movies, movie making is not the business to go into at all. Really? I mean, the, the functionality of it, absolutely not. And, you know, especially with action movies or stuff that I'm more getting into, it's extremely technical and, you know, time consuming and tedious. And these, these sequences that take, take us forever to figure out, weeks to figure out. And I shoot them on a photo, on a still camera, and I add them photo boards together. And then we do all the stuff and proof of concepts with the stunt guys. And then somebody just watches it in 30 seconds and says, oh, it's pretty good. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's a completely different experience. And I happen to like the process of making the movie. I like, you know, figuring out where the sun's going to rise and figure out, uh, you know, what shots can I get away with at noon and which ones can I not? And where can I do turf, uh, Irish turnarounds, like cheating the set? And where can I do this? Like, that what's an Irish, me. what's an Irish turnaround? I've never heard that. An Irish turnaround is like where you just, you keep the camera more or less where it is and just redress the background and flip the eye lines, you know, oh. um, for, you know, often for like sun or like when you're in the woods, for instance, you really don't have any reference or if the shot's compressed enough with a lens, you can't tell the background enough. So you could save, get better light and save time. Where did the Irish part of that come into oh, I, I mean, But you know, this half the stuff, the, 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 the vernacular filmmaking is very uh, regional. You know, I have no idea if anybody else says it, you know, you know. but when I say <laughs> shot reverse shot, we say tick and talk, you know, and these things kind of catch on. We did the tick, we owe the talk. Um, but yeah, they, they don't teach it that, uh, you know, school of visual arts. So we're here to talk about, well, first of all, I was so, I, I was looking at your IMDb this morning and you shot Righteous Gemstones, which I love, oh my God. I loved, loved, loved that show. I don't think there's been a show that I latched onto so quickly. Like within 10 minutes of that show, I'm like, all right, I'm going to love it. You know, you, you know, you get on these series and it, some of them take a couple episodes and you're like, okay, I, I think I may like this. It's going to take a while. But then there are others within the first five, 10 minutes, the first scene, you're like, yes, this, this is going to be my show. Um, and I felt that way about Righteous Gemstones. And it, it, I can see just sort of looking through your IMDb with Vice Principals, Righteous Gemstones, you are working quite a bit with this same group, this kind of Danny McBride, you know, crew. Um, which has just got to be so much fun. But what I'm, what I'm curious about is that you go from something like Righteous Gemstones, Vice Principles, clearly a comedy, and how are you sort of implementing the style and the feel of, that comes from working within that family to a horror movie, like the Halloween franchise? You, you know, especially, I just finished season two of Gemstones. Oh, I, I shot most I of it. Wait. And uh, we, they just wrapped it recently. And... Um, it's like the scale of uh, um, what would what, be the Game of Thrones. It's, just, I mean, it's so big now. The, wow. it, we're flipping cars every day. Just motorcycles are jumping over stuff. It's just, it just happens to me making people laugh, you know? So I, I, and one of the reasons Danny and I get along so well is I never approached his work as a comedy. It wouldn't even occur to me, you know? And I grew up 
shooting for the whitest kids you know and doing sketch comedy stuff. But I uh, I shoot these things like a I try to shoot them like a Bergman family drama or like a heightened Scorsese scene or you know I, I try to r- bring something crazy to it. I was trying to like use Casino as my reference to the early stuff in Gemstones. Brandon really? Tross was a was a fantastic DP. He shot the pilot, and then I shot most of the rest. And my camera operator Paul Daly shot a lot of them. But I tried to bring this sort of like yeah, casino Scorsese thing to it, and sometimes you win, sometimes you you lose. I well, never curse me. I'm sh- I'm shooting a comedy. Well, my I mean, to me, that show absolutely yeah. is a win, and the fact that you're getting huge budgets for season two says that I'm certainly not the only one. Um, but I like this idea of not shooting it like the genre that it's in. So you you approach that show and you're saying I'm not going to shoot this like a comedy. When you go to Halloween Kills, though, do you shoot that quote like a horror film? What do you take to that? Uh, do I shoot Halloween Kills like a horror film? Uh, Halloween 2018, definitely not. That one, I, I remember we were talking about, you know, Friedkin films and, you know, Carpenter, people that are, they just happen to have made a horror film. They're not horror directors. Yeah. You know, uh, Halloween Kills is a lot more gore in it. Yep. You know, so th- th- some aspects had to be, I guess, shot mm-hmm. more gory. Uh, um, although I, and, you know, and it, 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 there's a lot of nighttime exteriors, so there is some kind of more genre photography. Also, you're, there's a whole flashback sequence which has to match the original 2018 movie, so uh, that was obviously had to look like a 1978 or whatever the year the original came out had to match that style with hard lighting and stuff. Yeah, and let's talk about that because I mm-hmm. there's a, a sequence in there that goes back to 1978, like you mentioned. Um, and we've got some questions about this on Instagram as well. People want to know, how did you mm-hmm. shoot that? Uh, we, you know, with just the, the lighting techniques of the time, you know, like on the, the uh, Dean Kundi 2078 I mean, one, I think there's like one electrician listed on the credits. Wow. There's like a gaffer. It, like it's, so we tried to not use as many lights. I try to not use as many lifts. I try to use more direct light. Uh, and, uh, you know, some gel in front of the lights and keep it harder. So uh, the lighting style of the 78 one definitely and was different units and different heads, the lighting heads, than the, um, the current footage. I mean, some influence it st- lingers over between the two because I wanted the 2018 one to kind of see- feel like the original Halloween 2, but with yeah. more modern, softer lighting. So that was what we did. It was just kind of technical. And then with the grains, we did it mostly in post. I didn't use like vintage lenses. I used the same lenses, anamorphics. Well, yeah, let's talk about that. What was the camera package you chose and the lenses you paired with it? You know, I can't remember every detail, but it, I know it's a, st- I always use Airy. I always use um, Alexa's. It was not an LF because there's no, there was no anamorphic for LFs at the time. Now there probably is. Um, we're about to do Halloween ends pretty soon. I'll probably keep the same look. Uh, and it was, it was, uh, you know, I'm so embarrassed to say it's either cook anamorphics. I believe it's cook anamorphics that we used. And then on Halloween kills, I had an anamorphic zoom on Halloween. The original 2018 Halloween, we used a uh, spherical zoom with an um, adapter on the back. Why those little changes? It sounds, for the most part, it's relatively similar, but you kind of swapped out some lenses and made some revisions to it. What was the thought behind that? I couldn't get access to a Cook anamorphic zoom when I did the 2018 movie. They're they're very rare. They're very very, uh, tricky and finicky. And I was able to get it on Halloween Kills, but I wish I had a spherical one also Mm because there's too much weird stuff going on on the edges and it's some stuff's just the lens falls apart and you need, you need a lot of light. So it, it was a little tricky to use. You'll see, you'll see some anam- anamorphic mistakes in Halloween kills. Was, is there one you can point to that really bothers you? Oh, yeah. The stuff in that, um, the stuff in that, uh, bar scene where there's some focus, like it's not the focus puller. It's just the lens can't focus on like the top of the frame or something. So you're saying like aberrations in the outer borders of the frame that you got from that anamorphic zoom? Yeah, you know, these things are get very finicky. Like, I don't know, you know, a two eight on the upper right corner, it seems to fall apart quicker than the bottom left. 
You know, like, the, the, and you have to kind of, and David is um, a very experienced director. So he's, he wants what he wants. You know, it's not like I can come in as the old dog and say, well, sorry, David, this lens will only focus in the middle right now due to sure. my F-stop. So. Well, is he, is he kind of understanding of the limitations of the gear usually? Uh, is he understanding on some days and other days he says, <laughs> uh, you know, the shot we discussed, why is it not being achieved? You know, he, what do you want me to do? Figure it out for you. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Um, I want to talk for a couple minutes more about this choice to use a zoom lens for Halloween kills. Um, it's an interesting decision to me. I think you oftentimes hear a lot of people sticking with prime sets. Um, you hear a lot about vintage lenses lately, at least we, a lot of the DPs we have coming on the show talk about that. Um, I don't hear too much, uh, uh, too many people choosing zooms. And when they do, it's for a very specific reason. So I'm curious how that got in your kit. Well, the, 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 the anamorphic zoom is inherently shorter, meaning it has less um, millimeter to millimeter than a spherical. Spherical can go from like, three 250 to 25 uh, um whatever we call that lens and um that we used on halloween uh 2018 you could see that in the checkerboard prison yes. where we meet michael there's a very high angle and it zooms in from very wide to very close the anamorphic zoom could not achieve those kind of shots and it chose to be less useful uh david from george washington his first film on love okay. zooms and he loves like lateral moves with zooms and curving around people with zooms. So it's part of his aesthetic and it's part of kind of a horror aesthetic too. It's, it's not used as much in Halloween kills. And the limitations of that lens by the end of the shoot, I was probably not using it at all. Yeah. What, what does it, for people out there that are, that are listening to the show, we have a lot of young filmmakers that are just kind of getting into the, to the industry. Um, do you have any sort of insight into the value of a zoom? What does it allow you to do on set? Like, does it make you move quicker or do, is there, is there anything about it that is a benefit? And also, is there anything that's a detriment as well? Zooms. I mean, what, I mean, I, that's like, a, I could talk about that for two hours. Uh, um, well, obviously the difference, there's two ways to move a can move an image, enlarge it. You could enlarge it with a zoom or you could move the camera forward. Okay. And they both have totally different practicalities, uses effects you know a, a zoom is obviously more voyeuristic because it's 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 blowing the image up it has a um like a peeping tom voyeur type thing happen opposed to the dynamic movement of a camera sweeping through space where you have the parallaxes and all that stuff like that and zooms tend to work fairly well in horror you know because uh, of the voyeur nature of the cat and mouse chases yeah. yeah and i think that is particularly like th that that is what halloween especially is about that kind of hunting that you know following michael myers as he's slowly hunting somebody in the streets and and i think capturing that in a zoom sort of makes sense because it does have that voyeuristic feel so that that works for me mm -hmm. opposite side of that what does a zoom lens kind of tie you to that may not be beneficial? Why, like, why, why wouldn't you use a zoom in a particular circumstance? You know, like, I, you, you want to be op, there's a certain optical distance you want to be from something to understand what that action is. Okay. So for instance, like if I'm accepting money or something like that, and I'm closing a hand, the zoom from, across the room, you won't feel the, the object in the hand. You know, you need to be semi-optically close to it, like, a, you know, a, a 50 millimeter, which is a neutral lens. Um, so that, that's why you wouldn't just want to just enlarge the millimeter. You know, it's not beneficial. Uh, it can be a bit lazy sometimes. Um, also, it's very tricky for the lighting because wide lighting is always very broad because you're just trying to get the lights out of the frame. And as you move closer and closer and closer, you can massage the lighting. But as you move the camera closer and closer and closer, if you start with a, a wide zoom shot and you start zooming in, you no longer can finesse the lighting as you're going in. Mm. Okay, That's why like, you would never want to go from a wide shot to a close-up on a woman. It would be unflattering. You know, in a horror movie, you can get away with that kind of stuff. But uh, 
So that that's a very sp- specific reason why you'd want to avoid it. Mm. Yeah, I, I've never heard it. I have. I've never heard it explained quite like that. But that does make sense about wanting to be as close to the object as you can in certain circumstances, rather than a zoom in. It is a totally different feel. I I, I well, think that makes sense. And but as a cinematographer, like a big part of the gig is like understanding what the audience understands you know do we understand uh something's been stolen do we under, you know, we're just every time we shoot a shot we're, we're discussing or a sequence we're discussing the micro story of that shot do we understand and maybe we come up with some some examples but uh and the le- the millimeter chosen helps better explain that and dean kundi is the master of this stuff you know like Un, the, the minute story of the water bouncing in uh, Jurassic Park or something like that. Like yeah, he, he's extremely yeah. good at like uh, simplistic storytelling, which uh, eventually becomes very hyper complicated. But he's telling a series of very simple stories throughout his projects, and, and every one of his films are like that. That thought about the micro story within a scene. I like this concept a lot. And I, I want to see if we can maybe just expand on that a little bit because I just started watching, I'm only 10 minutes in, but there's this whole movie about the the editing sequence and the shot sequence of the of shower scene in Psycho, which it's unbelievable mm-hmm. that we're still talking about that so many years away, but that just goes to show you the impact of that edit in that shot. I can't remember the name of it. I'll find it before the end of the episode. Um, if people want to check it out, but I'm only 10 minutes in and so far it's great. But um, I'm I'm getting more fascinated with this idea of shots like that, like that the the um, the water in the puddle in Jurassic Park, like those are iconic shots, and they just kind of help support the story that's going on in that environment. Um, but I feel like horror movies, especially, need those types of things because you have to tell the story, like of in in uh, Michael Myers' situation, like you know the the object that's being held, how the object hits the victim how the victim gets killed in that instance. Like there are a lot of things you need to understand that go beyond the idea of just like, oh, Michael killed that person. There's there's so many steps along the way. Can you, and maybe you don't have a perfect example, but can you sort of break down the, the, apply that thought process of, you know, having the, the, the little shots in the scenes that help support the, the stories within the scene in Halloween kills. Cause I, I feel like there are going to be many instances, almost every kill will have an instance like that. A, a 2018 film, I could think of very con- concrete examples, which are like Lori Strode has a section of her kitchen that opens up with the click of a button that leads into this other place. Now that's easy to write, but it's very weird to see. You've never, you know, we, we need to understand the steps are below that so that's a specific shot we need to understand uh the click of this button opens this thing up and then we need to understand that she's rigged this house with all these like gates which is it's nothing you've ever seen you know so we've got to establish these things and we have to establish these gas pipes and where these flames are coming from and and then michael picks up uh like a poker from um a like a, a can't what do you call the fireplace now you try to go film a fire poker being picked up in a nearly pitch black room. Like it's a very abstract object. So yeah. I need to somehow, you know, we put the camera from above because it felt that it's the clearest version of that story possible. You know, and then there's a frying pan and we have to understand that uh, Andy, the actress grabs this frying pan. Like those are really specific things that, that are happening in that sequence. And, uh, I'm always, you have to shine a light on those specific objects just so the audience can tell where this piece, this potential object of violence came from and how it hit the subject. Yeah, you're right. Because if you don't know what the object is, you don't understand the threat of it. No, so it's just a bunch of blur happening, you know, in a dark space. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's interesting. And I, I was thinking about that last night watching um, watching Halloween Kills because in, it's not really the opening scene, but the first time we see that Michael Myers has made it out of this fiery blaze, um, he's holding a different weapon for him, which is, I mean, he usually, his iconic weapon is the knife and he uses all sorts of things in this in this um, movie. But he has this new weapon. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, is this now going to be his weapon of choice? Turns out it wasn't, but I was thinking to myself like, okay, now they're gonna have to figure out how to make that weapon look menacing. 
because it's so long. I, I can't even, I don't even know what it's called, but it was like the blunt part of it was so far away from the handle. I was thinking that you don't have the intimacy, I guess, I don't, for lack of a better word, of a stabbing that he usually does. So I was kind of- it's called the Halligan, and uh, many hours were discussing, went to discussing the Halligan. Really? And fi fireman protocol, and we had professional firemen in the office explaining how, what would happen, and these beepers, and, you know, you know, trying to get some accuracy and how they would enter the, the you know, the space. Uh, well, actually, I'm glad you brought that up, because I wanted to talk about that entire scene, and because... It, it is a giant sequence that's completely engulfed in flames. And I know we certainly have some fire in the last Halloween and you see fire in all sorts of films, but we, we've we never talked about specifically how to film fire on Go Creative Show, at least that I can remember. Um, so I, I'd like to just learn a little bit about the way you approach that. There, there must be just cinematography, planning your shots, but also there's a safety component to it. Like there's a lot of complication to filming fire. And it's one of the most iconic scenes of the film. It's in the trailer. It's that first really heroic shot of Michael Myers when he emerges. And it's kind of that like badass shot of the film that you always expect in a Halloween film. It's there in that scene and fairly early in the film. Well, um, the location's kind of interesting. So the, the, first, the original 2018 house was actually on the, it was part of a set for vice principals. Okay. We, we were filming on that road and then we remembered that house, which were, was not in vice principals, but that whole farm area was in. So then we chose that house because we knew we could burn it down. Okay. So in 2018, we kind of, we, we didn't, you know, we almost burnt the house down as much as you could. Okay. And then we had, an interior set that was built outside for all the, the burns. And then we shut, now shot the next movie in South Carolina, I mean, in North Carolina, in Wilmington. So we needed to find a new house that looked enough like the old one to reburn down for him to come out. Wow. So, we, we, so that's randomly, not the same house? No, randomly. Wow, you Kale, would never know. We, they spent a lot of money. They did a really good job. But we found this house in the middle of nowhere that we could have Michael come out with the whole burning thing. But now, obviously, there's an interior component. So we had to build on the stages and screen gems a two-story burn set. That's just the interior. Now, that's a real tricky thing, that something that can structurally handle that much heat yeah. in two stories for the fireman to fall through and there's, you know, wires for him to fall and all that stuff like that. But uh, so that scene's mostly lit by, I mean, mostly by the fire. and. Then we use some giant maxis on some flicker gadgets with some color on it. And the fire does most of the work. On the first one, we ended up burning, like her messing up some lenses and the map boxes because we were not as experienced with fire. But you basically have to wrap the whole crew in like panther cloth and like everyone's wearing like the, the track suits from NASCAR and stuff like that. And the people in the room have to be on um, not passive oxygen, like oxygen how it works, like it forces it into you or something like that. I, you know, there's a whole complex thing. I'm nowhere near the set. I'm at a DIT table. It's, <laughs> so you're like, getting closer, getting closer, getting closer. <laughs> I, it's just, it's just absolute chaos, you know, when you're, and there's like 30 cameras going. Oh my God. That there, yeah, that was, what were you most surprised with? Or what was one of the things you were, you were surprised about when you were um, filming, you know, yet another fire scene um, there must have been just some lessons learned about like, oh, I guess we can't do, you know, X because of Y or something like that. Was there something that you just never expected to have to deal with? You know, after the 2018 fire sequence, we kind of knew what we were getting into. So, mm -hmm. we, you know, we, we got pretty good at it, to be honest. And, and um, we just knew that that's your day. I mean, you're not going to be, you know, shooting uh, other scenes you know, yeah. if I, a fire day is a fire day and it, it, it's very time consuming and just the safety aspect and then once you get filming it's extremely fast you know because you you don't for xyz reasons not that interesting and then you, you got to get your specific inserts and, that, and then that takes forever you know the hand grabs and all that stuff yeah are you doing your inserts just somewhere else later on and just like, like scenes that don't necessarily need to see fire or the fire that it sees is very little. Are you just pulling those inserts out of the house set and doing it later? Those are good questions. Um, 
often uh, we'll leave uh, the camera operator, Paul Daly, who also shoots a lot of it, second unit. We'll leave him behind on a set with a reduced MOS crew, and he'll do some inserts while we kind of block out the next scene and figure that out. And then he comes and joins us again. Uh, a, a, a fire set is very specific. So on that case, we'd probably complete all the work in the scene. So you would just do the inserts in the scene, deal with the safety precautions, all that stuff, regardless of how much fire you see in the shot? Most likely, most likely. Um, I don't remember carrying any inserts from the fire and stuff, but inserts of like, you know, what's in people's hands, they always get carried. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine if you don't really need to, but also at the same time, those are so easy to forget almost because they're, I mean, doing this whole elaborate scene for two days and then saying, oh, we'll just get, you know, we'll get the hand, you know, grasping something later on. I I can see that. I I think I would have a little bit of fear and maybe this is just the producer in me. I'd have that little bit of fear of like, we cannot forget this. (laughs) Like we've got to make sure we get this shot. And just kind of doing it so separate from the scene. I don't know. It, it, It opens up a lot of vulnerability to either not matching or being forgotten. Do you have fears like that at all? Well, ultimately, I mean, David's such an experienced director. He know, you know, he decides and he approves, and you know, and he and he knows which ones someone could just send him a photo of, and he could he could approve it, and he knows which ones he needs to do on the day, and he knows which ones, you know, that there's a million different versions of how it gets achieved, and obviously, you, you want to complete the scene in the time given on that set, but sometimes you're going to owe an insert, and then sometimes you're going to shoot one that you didn't realize you needed, you know, once they start editing the thing. Let's take a moment and talk about MZ empowering filmmakers. Now, you want to think about MZ as the Netflix for filmmaking education, and uh, it's because it really is. I mean, when you go to MZ.com, you are faced with hundreds of hours of high-quality video-based filmmaking education that covers everything we need to know, cinematography, post-production, visual storytelling, and more. And it's not just about the courses, it's also about the educators. You know what I mean? I don't know if you're anything like me, but I need a good teacher or else I just cannot learn. I just have to have that kind of personal relationship, I guess, if you will. And that's what you get with MZ because we're having educators on there that are, you know, A-listers working in the industry right now. And I'm talking about people like Vincent Laferre. I'm talking about Shane Hurlbut, Philip Bloom, Tom Cross, the editor of La La Land, Whiplash, No Time to Die. He teaches a course called The Art and Technique of Film Editing. But there's all sorts of stuff in there. Advanced editing with DaVinci Resolve. There's a course called Indie Film Blueprint. It's basically like a roadmap to how to plan, shoot, and sell your first indie feature. And the best part is, uh, because MZ is a sponsor of the show, we are giving our audience uh, 20% off of your purchase. So yes, you can buy individual courses, and that's great. But what I suggest is you become an MZ Pro member, because then you get access to all of it. And both of those things, you can get 20% off by using code GCS20 at checkout, GCS20. To go to MZ, um, actually, best thing to do is go to gocreativeshow.com forward slash MZ. That way they know that you learned about them from us. So it helps us, it helps you, it helps them. Everything is good in the world. Gocreativeshow.com forward slash MZ. There are a ton of nighttime scenes in Halloween Kills, and we actually have a question from Mango Shake on Instagram about how did you shoot these night scenes without a lot of noise, which is, now I watched it on Peacock um, streaming, so I didn't get to see it in its full, you know, cinema glory, which I plan to do this weekend. But, you know, when I, whenever I watch anything on my TV, especially through streaming, it, 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 there's a, you sort of lose that grain. You just do. Everything's a little bit cleaner. So to me, it looked extremely clean. Um, but to have somebody that saw it in the cinema also commenting on a loss of noise in the night scene made me think this might be a topic to discuss. So can you talk to us about your approach to the night scenes in this film? Oh, there's so, so many. But I mean, noise comes from like trying to lift information from where there is very little information. I, I think that's a decent way to explain it. Yeah. So like if you want to see something and a nighttime shot, you generally have to shine a light on it, you know? And if you don't see it, you generally don't shine a light on it. So the things you don't shine a light on, you call them black. And then you, you know, I'm not pushing the camera, pushing meaning uh, changing the ISO. I think I shoot it at like 1200 or 800, somewhere around there for the whole shoot. I'm never bumping it up. So th- that's why there's, 
So the reason you would get noise is from bumping it up mm. and trying to see into the shadows. And then I'm, I don't think I'm really doing that. Uh, but there's a lot of light, you know, we're, we're filming in Wilmington, North Carolina. So there's not, it's, it's not like suburban light pollution. So we have a lot of condors. We have a lot of, a lot of light going on. And, it's, and then you let the rest fall off to black. Do you have a favorite nighttime scene? Oh, in that movie. You know, the thing that I think is most interesting is the, the kill scene on the street at the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. Um, because we, we, we combined street footage on location with like stuff shot in a black box that's not on location. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone tracks it, but it was like, and we cut it together. And I think it's interesting. It was a, it was a stylistic choice. It was two pronged. You know, there's two issues. One was we couldn't achieve the amount of violence we wanted to for Michael's end rampage on the street in the amount of night given. Mm. Okay. And the set was so abstract, which was like two head, two groups in headlights and violence. So we just did it in a black box and we had like a turning wheel table, you know, like a, a, a not a rotisserie, but like a, a turntable, we call it like a giant turntable. And we just filmed like Michael doing the kills, like with like just lights behind them and flares and just super close up and slashes and blood. And we spent a, a whole day as a second unit, just shooting that stuff and intercut it with the violence on the street. Huh. So that, that I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, I, it's seamless when you watch it for sure. You, you yeah, really... and, and it's not even, it's not even supposed to be seamless. Like if you kind of watch it again, you're like, Oh, that is kind of heightened. You know, that is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing that I'm kind of proud of is that, um, the, the house, any shots facing the Myers house are on a stage. There's a no job. We, we, we built a high, a huge uh, street location on a stage, anything shooting down the streets or across the street, except for a few shots are on location. Okay. So, uh, not even so everything that's like a TikTok between the front door and, and across yeah. is done in a studio. Anything that's a TikTok down the street in both directions is location. And I think they we ended up cutting together pretty seamlessly. Oh yeah. Absolutely. And I and that kind of outside neighborhood walking around your town, um, walking around your your neighborhood is so crucial to Halloween. Like that is the essence of the first one. There are many scenes mm -hmm. in the first one, just like long tracking shots walking down the street and you build a lot of tension in those scenes. And I think, you know, the, the exterior plays such a major role in this franchise. You guys did it great in 2018 and did it great again for Halloween kills. Um, I want to talk to you about the hospital and your sort of visual approach to that, because in the Halloween lineage, I guess for lack of a better word, Halloween two does take place in a hospital. So you sort of have that framework. Now I'm sure you know, a lot of people watching this may have not even seen Halloween 2 or care or doesn't matter, but it's still there. It's still in sort of the, the, the story of Halloween. Um, and you're once again doing it here in the hospital. So can you talk to me about that? So Halloween 2, uh, the original Halloween 2, uh, takes place in a hospital predominantly. And in our world of the Halloween franchise, we make it so only Halloween 1 exists, I believe. Yeah. And but we wanted to have like an echo of Halloween two in our movie. So we thought it'd be fun to put a, a long sequence in a hospital. Uh, the original one, it's, it's like that all the lights are off and we wanted to make it a little bit more realistic, you know, uh, in our hospital, the hospital was a set. It was uh, originally for swamp thing. And we oh, uh, right. like changed it and doubled up or tripled up the size. So it was a big giant set, including that doubled lobby room was a set which was pretty impressive wow. uh, Richard Wright designed and then there's the exterior which is you know in downtown Wilmington um it was tricky there's a lot of you know logic bombs where you're like I'm happy we put that window between Laurie Strode's room in the hallway even though I'm, I'm not sure how realistic it would be but it, it certainly helped there's a lot of tricky scenes in that well so she could see what's going on and that, that there's some sort of uh world out there and it's just not a woman against a, a wall with little headboard light behind her. Yeah, there's like a lot. Of, there's a lot of pages in that room. 
There is. And actually, I, I noticed that window. I didn't I didn't necessarily think it was a set. It could have been. It may not. Who knows? I yeah. didn't have a strong opinion either way. But I did like the fact that, I mean, her whole storyline is once she finds out that Michael Myers is alive, she needs to get out. So mm -hmm. having the world outside that she kind of can't necessarily get to the way she wants, I thought really played into her character and, and yeah. made a lot of sense. Plus, you have the ability to bring some light in. And I think there is something about the helplessness of being in a hotel, a uh, hotel, in a, certainly not a hotel, the helplessness of being in a hospital and seeing the world outside a little bit. There totally. is there is a helplessness there. And um, I think you guys did a great job. Talk to me about the color in the hospital. You know, you're usually going for like a mixed, you know, uh, cool white. I mean, you mix tungsten and daylight together. You want to make it off, but then you want to make it different layers of off. You know, uh, meaning like that room slightly green, that room slightly daylight. You know, it, it, like it sh or else it feels very boring, at least to me. You know, so you want the morgue to feel a, a little off, but I don't want it to go in any extremes because it's. I like to think that Halloween takes place in a kind of a, a real world and not in a you know like a saw kind of world. Yeah. You know, or so. Uh, yeah, just subtle, subtle light changes, and um, that's it. You know, it was very tricky because we we have like two hundred extras in these chase sequences. You know, that goes where they chase the um, that that dude that they think is Michael Myers and. That was a real challenge where you have just handheld cameras with like a stampede of people and a lot of safety issues where you have to make sure the set can hold that much weight. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's been built. Yeah, you do. I was thinking about that. Of course, I was approaching it as if it was a real hospital location, but um, those stampede scenes are, I mean, the amount of extras you had was just incredible. And not just extras milling around in the background, like active extras <laughs> that, are, that are very much in your scene. That's got to be a challenge. Like, do you do you enjoy working with a ton of extras, or is it more of a hindrance? That was the extras is the most difficult aspect of this movie. Uh, you know, and it just takes like one that looks in the camera to ruin the whole shot, or you know, like because you're trying to shoot. When I mean, you talk about like the, like the semiotics, like what we're actually seeing, you want to show a group of people. Now, the second you start to notice one. It's no longer a group of people. It's that's a great point. It, the, there's one person in a group of people, or like same with like people blowing past the camera. Like second, somebody creates too much of a story, it's a problem. You know, uh, it, yep. if that's not the goal, if that's not the goal, the goal is just to like show movement of people. But then like maybe the movement of people is best told by making it about one person trying to claw past another. You know, so these are the elements you're trying to trying to work with. And the other thing you got to be careful of is if you're shooting groups of people, next thing you know, that person's looking cameras, get rid of them. That person's wardrobes, it's too weird that he's dressed like a tiger. That person's like clown, get rid of that. And the next thing you know, you've just whittled away your background. So now ah. you just have like a couple dozen. So you have to be mindful of those kind of decisions. I don't have an opportunity to work with certainly that many extras, but uh, in my work, I have done a few things where there's maybe 10, 15, 20 extras. And what I found is that it's sort of two opposing forces. Like as, as a director or, you know, whatever my role happens to be at that moment, um, you, you don't really want the extras to be, to stand out in a way, like you said, you want it to be a group. But they, as extras, want to stand out. They they sort of yeah, want to yeah. be noticed. This is their this is their time in the light. And it I've I've had situations where those kind of opposing forces, where you kind of have those extras that want to provide a performance, give you too much, are too noticeable, and it's it goes against kind of the goal that you're going to with these extras. Do you find that as well, even at something at, the, at a high level like Halloween Kills? Well, you know, I don't <laughs> believe in the concept of unskilled labor. I believe all labor is skilled yeah. and um, extras and background performers included. There's ones that get it. They, they understand their, their role, that to be engaged, understand what's going on, create their micro story in the background. And then there's other ones that are trying to be noticed. And then there's other ones that just look confused. And, you know, you can tell it's their first day ever on a set, you know? So, yeah, yes. are there more skilled background artists than other background artists, 100%. Yeah. Do you have a favorite kill in Halloween Kills? And um, for those that 
have seen the first one as well and haven't seen the second one. The second one, I think there are significantly more kills in Halloween Kills than in Halloween 2018. And um, I think it's just, it's it's really nice, especially when you think about this as the trilogy that it will be, having that different pace and that different feel. Across all three, I think it's going to be nice. But that said, do you have a favorite? Well, Halloween Kills structurally is like, it's like a series of short films. It's, like, it's a series of vignettes. Mm. And there's some through lines with some of them. And it, it's it's pretty, it's not nearly as narrative as 2018. Yeah. Um, so it's it's interesting that you, it's very difficult to like recall certain moments, you sure. know, because we we then we go hang out with the um, the gay couple that lives in his new house, and that's its own story for you know fifteen minutes. And then there's the park story, you know, in the. Um, but as far as like, uh, I like when Anthony Michael Hall gets killed. I think we did a pretty cool job with that. I think extreme close up, uh, cameras pointing straight down. He was on a turntable. Just wiping through frame. I thought that was an interesting kill. Um, I, you know, the guy falling out of the window is pretty unique. I, I love mean, the, car then, uh, the car scene. The car scene. Yeah, when you when uh, Michael Myers was bashing oh, through yeah. each window one at a time, and I loved it. I also yeah, like. I I think what I loved most about that scene is that after a majority of the killings were done, you had that kind of stalking moment where everything was quiet. You just heard the breathing in the mask and you just kind of saw him uh, you know, slowly walking over that bridge. And I, I, I liked the pacing of that. It was crazy and frenetic and insane paired immediately with the calmness that I've kind of associate with Halloween based on the first one. Well, that that, one, that scene took forever to to prep. Like, so David storyboarded it with his uh, guy Warren, and um, I uh, was like, well, "Listen, we got to figure out which do we need to cut a car in half? You know, what do we need? What doors need to come off? Like, yeah. what directions are we seeing?" And then I, I would go and I would shoot it with a still camera with Attila Usera, the AD, with different whoever happened to be around, and we did this like at least eight times. And we would then create the photo boards and then present them to David, and he would say this isn't right, change that. And the process went back and forth. And then we had to figure out, it was shot over multiple days. So, you know, you saw every direction outside that car and every direction in the park. So the logistics were just epic because you can't move the night lighting that many times in a night. You could move it like maybe once. Mm. So you had to shoot out like- Why, just because you ran out of time? Well, to move the condors, it's like for each direction takes at least two condors. And it's a huge- scope that field mm. so to move them you're talking like an hour and you're gonna lose an hour yeah. on a night shoot i mean you, you won't be a working dp if you keep behaving like that you have to figure out something else to shoot while they're moving okay yeah that makes sense so i, I interrupted you but you were saying that you that one of the limitations was you didn't want to move those condors or you just couldn't you just couldn't the the the, the, the you and you could have twice as many, which is maybe what we ended up doing. I can't really remember, but I just remember the that it was so technical, super tech. Like Michael has a the, the skull kid's mask, and then it somehow ends up on the. We understand that he's on top of the car, and then the yes. skull mask is on the dashboard, and the gun, the, the gunfire, uh, how each one of those windows gets blown up because resetting a window is epic. You know, that's you have to take the door off and all stuff like that. So, um. You know, can, can, which muzzle gun fires digital, which one's real. And you had that crazy, that crazy moment where I can't remember the character's name, but the gun turns accidentally on her and shoots oh, yeah. herself. It was just everything you could have, everything that could have gone wrong <laughs> in, in that moment went wrong in that car. It was just a real exercise in chaos. <laughs> it really was. Oh, yeah. And like, that just that gun thing, you know, that took a couple hours to discuss, you know, in prep and test and all this. Like, how can you understand that she's firing? Michael is somehow not getting hit. Michael waits to a certain mo moment to kick the door, forcing her hand to go like that, where she pulls the trigger on herself. Yeah, that, that you know, it's maybe it's not as good as the Hitchcock shower scene, but it requires just as much time and energy to understand that story. I can imagine. Do you watch Fargo, the TV series? No, I have not watched it. Well, it, it, I bring it up only because in the most recent series with Chris Rock, it, one of the main characters similarly ends up killing themselves by their own gun. And it was 
it was pretty why we talk about that in the in the episode we do with the dp um it, it's it's amazing how challenging it was for him and it, and it sounds like for you too to make that look realistic because it's it's a mistake but it can't look cartoonish it has to look like that could happen and i think you guys oh, yeah. did a great job of that oh but that's a cinematographer thing where you're like i'm not sure the thing that needs to happen can actually physically happen in real life mm. you know and, and then you have to find a way to bury that problem or make it work we have that, in gemstone and gemstones we have that in this next season where we're like i don't know how this thing happened but I have to film it in a way to make the audience understand it happened. Yeah. And with Halloween being sort of rooted in reality as it, at its core, you know, you can't start making these little decisions that make it seem supernatural. It just, it kind of kills it. And even if there's only one, it's sort of one thing leads to another and you start getting a flavor in your mouth of like, this isn't as real as it should be. Oh yeah. I mean, also like with like a lot, I always call them logic bombs. We're like, where's the police? <laughs> you know, like you have to sort of bury these, uh, but I always say logic is the enemy of the filmmaker. If you, if you get too logical about where people are and who has and hasn't gone to the bathroom, you've kind of stopped understanding how movies are constructed. <laughs> I, I always felt that way about 24 watching that. Like they never eat. Yeah. There's never one <laughs> moment of that show where anybody eats anything. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, the Lenny Clark scene, which I thought oh, that- my. That stuck out to me because I just had, oh my God, I had the great opportunity of being able to direct him for a commercial recently. And what a great guy, just super, super nice. And then seeing him in the scene last night, I'm like, oh my God, he got a pretty wild scene. And it, I mean, it's hilarious and scary at the same time, but the kills for him and his wife were just nuts. And that, I want to just talk to you about kind of working with him, that scene, your experience, what you thought overall. Well, Larry, maybe David's never verbalized this to me, David Green, but I think he likes to create this bizarre world, like, you know, like the Hanna-Barbera universe. You know, like there's just like people that come and go from projects, from gemstones to Halloween to, you know. So Larry came from um, from Stronger. He was Lenny in David's Clark. film. You're talking about yeah, Lenny, Lenny Clark? Clark. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, Lenny Clark. Lenny Clark came from Stronger. And then the woman is the groundskeeper of the cemetery in the 2018 Halloween. No way. I didn't yeah, recognize her. Yeah. Yeah. Like the whole movie is just Easter egg after Easter egg after Easter egg, you know? So yeah. So he, he brought in Le uh, Lenny as the, um, the husband that I believe was the first sequence we shot. It probably took a day. It was absolute chaos. <laughs> and um, Nice guy. I mean, it was fun. You know, we had to make sure we shot everything prior to the kills before lunch and then like after lunch we're just you know stabbing with the, the light bulb and all that stuff yeah the fluorescent bulb when he when michael myers smashes that um uh fluorescent bulb you're like oh no <laughs> this is not good you don't want to yeah, see yeah. that <laughs> that's for yeah, sure yeah. Well, and, the then, movie... and then the, 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 and then the stabbing with with lenny at the end that was like a, yes took forever to figure out how to do that that was that was the whole thing that was a cool moment because his wife was forced to watch that, even though, you know, just, just knowing that that was her last dying vision, uh, yeah. it, it, it was just so gruesome. But there's something about the way that you guys are handling this particular, you know, part of Halloween and, it, and its life cycle, I guess we'll say, there is this touch of humor in a weird way. It, it, and maybe it just... It, I don't even know if it's intended or if this is just the mind of Danny McBride, but for some reason, there's that little bit of silliness, even in the most gruesome moments. Is that something that you're kind of infusing in there? Is that something you're consciously deciding? Or is that just kind of happening? I can't speak to it. I, you know, that's David and David's weird senses and stuff like that. And Danny, um, you know, they're, these guys are deep especially Danny, Danny's a deep cinephile and he's seen everything, really? you know, and every TV show, every criterion collection, everything. And I think, um, David just probably wants to put some levity once in a while, you know, sometimes yeah. they all maybe go a little too far and, you know, but, uh, yeah. And they, I don't know. They're very whimsical people. 
<laughs> well, the film is called Halloween Kills. Uh, I know it's on Peacock because I saw it on Peacock and certainly in the movie theaters. The, it's got to be the biggest movie of the weekend. I saw last night, it made over $50 million. And that's with streaming available as well. So this yeah. is going to be a monster film for you guys. And I'm I'm just so excited for you. And um, certainly all of the accolades are warranted. It's it's a lot of fun. And I'm already excited for the next one. So I know you guys <laughs> haven't started filming it yet, but what... When when is that supposed to start production? Very soon. I'm, I'm actually in the office right now. Uh, we're prepping. Um, I, I can't go too into it. We have a we're shooting a week for another horror film, and then the next uh, we do that in ten days about. And then the day we stop that, we start prep on Halloween um, ends. Oh wow! How exciting! Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for coming back on the show. And you know you're going to have to come back once Halloween ends come out. <laughs> sure, can't wait. All right, I want to thank Michael Simmons for coming on the show, talking all about Halloween Kills and a little bit about Halloween 2018. Uh, I love this franchise. It was such a fun movie to watch, and I hope you guys liked it. But please let us know what you think. You can find us everywhere, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, um, Facebook, it's all there. And let us know what you think of the episode, as well as subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. I want to thank our producer, Connor Crosby, uh, you can find him at ignitionvisuals.com and Dave Siegel from SiegelSound.com for mixing and mastering and making the show sound so good. Of course, our sponsor, MZ, and all things Go Creative Show at GoCreativeShow.com. Of course, you want to follow me and what I'm doing with my world and my work, you can find me at Ben Consoli on Instagram. That's where I post all my stuff. I want to thank you guys for joining us today, and we will see you next week on another episode of the Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers.